Hello, everyone. Um, often when I'm in this position, I introduce myself as Kabaku. And Kabaku always introduces himself by like, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kabaku. I am Kabaku. Again, Kabaku. Once Kabaku, forever Kabaku. Kabaku is my name. I'm a storyteller. You may wonder who's Kabaku. No. Kabaku is a character in a play by Bernard Dadier. Bernard Dadier is a writer, a playwright from Ivory Coast. He died a few years ago. And is really like the second generation of writers after the founders of big movements like Negritude, Senghor, Césaire, and then came the generation of Bernard Dadier. And Bernard Dadier was the, man, the first to write about the disillusion of independent nation states on the African continent. And there is a play of his called Moi Seul. Phonetically, you could translate it by I alone, but the way they spell it, it's got nothing to do with I alone. And in this play, there is this character of a watchman called Kabaku, and who introduces himself in this emphatic manner. My name is Kabaku, I am Kabaku. Again Kabaku, once Kabaku, forever Kabaku. And the watchman is literally at the doorway. He sees what's happening outside, but also what's happening inside. He opens the door to those two worlds. He may not have the power to intervene in either of the two worlds, but he's there. For a long time, I viewed myself as just a watchman. So going to Congo, going back home in 2001 after eight years abroad, as Omar just said, in Kenya first and then in Europe, I decided in 2001 that I needed to go home. 2001 is a crazy year in the country because we are right in the middle of the, the war that would officially end a year or a bit more after that. And so the country is divided into several pieces and the city of Kisangani, the city where I grew up, uh, was under rebel control, so I could not go back home. But I really needed to go back to the Congo because by then I understood that the kind of stories I wanted to tell were not stories from exile. And so maybe I don't have a lot of imagination to invent many worlds out there. So like Kabako, I just would like to stay alert, keep my antennas open, and see what's happening around me, and capture it, and maybe testify. So, because I, it was a necessity to go, to be in the Congo, I went to Kinshasa. And I started this company, or it's more than a company, we call Studio Kabaku, after this character, Kabaku, but it's also after a friend who, yeah, this year it will be 25 years since he passed, was one of the first people I met who, in Kisangani, northeast in Zaire, in the 80s, and said, I want to be an artist. I'm like, what does that mean? Because... You know, growing up in that city, we didn't have examples of people around us who are doing this professionally. So no one can inspire you and say, I want to become that. So we are dreaming of jobs that our mothers would recognize. Like, yeah, I wanted to study biology and law. This was very clear. So, and to work in conservation. That was my dream. But Kabako, he told me, I want to be an artist. It's like, wow, what's that? But 
though I was dreaming of studying law and conservation biology, I started writing poetry when I was 14. At 15, I think I was the youngest member of the Union of Zarian Writers then. And, and so being with these older people from that only age made me realize that uh, very only that I was not writing out of a vacuum. There were people before me who had written. And so it's like people have, have walked on this earth before and I'm here. I do my part and then I'll continue. So here is Kabako, the storyteller, the watchman, feeling the necessity to go back to the Congo and tell stories from there at first, just to tell stories. And I go home after eight years, what, did I, what do I find? It's a different country after eight years. For once, when I left, the country was known as Republic of Zaire. Going back, I was not going back to Zaire. I was going to the Democratic Republic of Congo. What did that really mean? I remember very clearly the day the country changed names. It's also the day I made, we were premiering our first work ever with my friends Opio Kach and Afra Tenenbergen in Nairobi. It was on 17th of May, 1997. That night, because we were doing everything on our own, we slept in the theater wrapped in like back, you know, black curtains because it got cold at some point in the night and Nairobi can get cold. And because we needed to finish the lights and we were too, you know, too late. And I have a ritual every morning I need to listen to radio, I need to listen to news. And that morning, I heard that Zaire no longer existed, and now the country had to be called Democratic Republic of Congo. I heard that morning that Mobutu Sisiseko Kukukbendu Azabanga, whom I'd known as the only man who could ever be the president of that country, had fled, and there was another head of state. It's like, how can this be possible? Did I live? Did I live in a lie all my life? Because this can't be. This country is called Zaire, and the only person who can be at the head of Zaire is Mobutu. I was taught that from age five when I went to school, because every morning we used to have what was called les 30 minutes révolutionnaires, the revolutionary half hour, meaning. For half an hour, the whole school is assembled in the schoolyard before going to classes, and we'd sing to the glory of Mobutu. Mobutu lelo, lelo, Mobutu lobi, lobi, Mobutu libela, libela, Mobutu eh, Mobutu ah, Mobutu Mobutu, sukisa, Mobutu Mobutu, sukisa, Mobutu Mobutu, sukisa, Mobutu today, Mobutu tomorrow, Mobutu forever. How can he ever go? This not possible. So from there on, I started really getting obsessed with the history of that country. What do I know? Really, if at all I know anything about that country. And when you start asking yourself that question, in that part of the world, I'm not only talking about Africa, uh, of Congo, but Africa in general. One thing you realize is that you don't have access to 
a lot of archives. Because, well, my part of Africa, my ancestors never wrote. So they developed other ways of recording their history. But then Europeans arrived and they declared all those ways of living, of reproducing oneself, invalid, and they imposed other ways. So the only written, so, and we had to learn to talk about ourselves in the written form. So it means that the only written archives go as far back as Europeans' arrival, 150, 200 years. What can you understand about the evolution of a people in such a short period of time? That's when I started thinking that maybe being a dancer can help me access a different type of archive. Because, yeah, where even a baby is ancient. Because genetically, there are things that directly can connect that baby to generations from a thousand years ago. So the question then is, like, could the body be an archive? Could dancing be a way of asking questions? What do you remember? Really, what do you remember? I don't even know if I would have the means to understand the language if it spoke back that at least to ask the question. So maybe dancing as an attempt to remember. To remember maybe a name, my name. Because what's incredible about the name is that if you're serious about it, you can never collapse into yourself. Particularly not into uh, me, 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 me type of thing. No. No name allows that because every name opens a web of relationships. Relationships to place, to history, to people. Just like today, you can say that my family name is Ligne Kula. It takes only a bit of observation to understand that actually I'm only Linecula because of colonialism. Because the family name institution did not exist in the Congo until the 30s. Everyone was named according to circumstances surrounding their birth, and then to identify where you were from, they would say, oh, okay, Itafuya from that village, son of so-and-so, from... And people's sense of territory was limited, and so everyone has their, had their name, and that's it. So my grandfather was called Linyekula, His sister was Koiko. He had a brother who was called Mangubo. So from the 30s, Belgians decided that Congolese needed to have family names. So my grandfather started the Linyekula family. Mangubo started the Mangubo family. So if you just look at names, you wouldn't know that they are siblings. So that example is just to show that 
when we're serious about names, we can never collapse into ourselves because of these relationships that they open. Going back home in 2001, arriving in that country that I could not recognize, a country that I think could not even recognize itself, a country which was in a perpetual process of rewriting its own his history and erasing whatever was there to suit the current political order. Suddenly I started feeling that, oh, I could not just be like the watchman. That when I really went back to Aimé Césaire, the poet from Martinique, and I'd like to share with you something from him. It is from his return to native land from 1939. This is actually a very strange thing for me, that when I went back home 18 years ago, suddenly Aimé Césaire became like a very important anchor for me. Because when I started writing, and with this awareness of people who had written before me, having met some elders who hammered into my head that Negritude was the epitome of any literary journey for a black person. My French teacher, who was also a writer in high school, that's what he used to say. The horizon is negritude. Of course, like any teenager, you want to rebel against that. It's like, what's this negritude thing? We are going to change the world. In fact, we used to say we'll change the fate of African literature. We are, we are the future, you know, Senghor, Césaire, that, so, 19th century, that past, you know. And then here I am, suddenly going back home and finding myself holding onto this poetry. And actually, it's not really about the whole of the negritude movement, but it is about Césaire. Senghor's poetry doesn't speak to me in the way Césaire's poetry does. And I came with time to understand that maybe it is this diasporic consciousness that suddenly I can identify with. Which is strange because when you were born on the African continent, you grew up there, which is my case, you are expected to have a stable sense of roots. And here I am, feeling totally displaced, and totally disconnected. And that sense of displacement kind of pushed me in the arms of the diasporic experience, which, which is not my reality. Hey, I was born on the motherland, as they say, you know. I grew up there. You know, I know where some of my ancestors came from. How can I feel lost? I wonder if it's not that sense that 
made me go towards Césaire. And so, when I started asking myself the question of how not to be just Kabako, just the watchman, reading this seemed to be like a possible answer. In Return to Native Land from 1939, this is a beautiful translation. I didn't know of this, and it's thanks to Omar that I came. This, yeah, this was translated by John, John Berger and Anna Bostock in 1968. And so in their translation, page 24, they write, he write, to leave. I would arrive sleek and young in that country, my country. And I would say to that country, hood clay is part of my flesh. I have wandered far and I am coming back to the lonely ugliness of your wounds. I would come to that country, my country, and I would say to it, kiss me without fear. And if I do not know what to say, it is still for you that I speak. And I would say to it, my mouth shall be the mouth of misfortunes which have no mouth. My voice, the freedom of those which break down in the prison cell of despair. And coming, I would say to myself, beware my body and soul Beware, above all, of crossing your arms and assuming the sterile attitude of the spectator. Because life is not a spectacle. Because a sea of sorrows is not a proscenium. Because a man who cries out is not a dancing bear. Life is not a spectacle. A sea of sorrows is not a proscenium. A man who's crying out is not a dancing bear. So what is it that I can do when, on one hand, I have this sense of ruins, ruins inside, ruins outside, Literally, the country has been through a terrible war, everything collapsed. I'm trying to make sense of all this. I don't even seem to understand what it means when I say I'm Congolese, apart from the fact that I hold a passport from that country. And yet, I don't want to be a spectator. So begins this journey, the journey of giving myself the possibility of a circle. This is a very fascinating f form, shape, image, the circle. You have circulation, energy that goes from the right shoulder necessarily comes back through the left. So there's solidarity, there is connectedness. It's like, how can I give myself a possibility of activating a circle? It doesn't mean that when you find a bit of it, it's, it's there. And no, you need to negotiate over and over and over and over. But at least to work towards it. 
so the the work became about creating a space. That's why I didn't call it company, or, but we called it studio. But not one studio. We say studios Kabako, Le Studio Kabako. There are many. And the Studio Kabako, 18 years ago, I wrote like a manifesto for the Studio Kabako. And it's in French, so I'm trying to translate it somehow. And it's like there are people who are crazy enough to believe that from the ruins there is a possibility of life to believe that from the you know from the blood and mud and sorrow you can still have some life and if you think that we are wasting our time well we are too smart for that that's how it ends and at first, it was not about having a physical space. In fact, I said, I don't want to have a physical space. Studio Kabako is a mental space. It's a space where we can say it is possible. And we even started saying that it's not about art. We don't care about art. The most important is that we can believe in something in a context where it's so difficult to believe in anything, not even God. So this is Studio Kabako. We are here. We are all studios. We are trying to imagine a possibility of beauty in the middle of the ruins, a possibility of life in the middle of death. And I think when 10 years ago we made our punk piece. And like all, it's a, okay, all these movements need slogans. So we too needed a slogan for ours. So it's like, okay, what did the punk in the late 70s say? Oh, they said, no future. It's like, wow. That was subversive for them, but in our context, no future, that's the norm, you know, so in, if you're in a place where everyone is busy destroying, if you say no future, you're just doing like everyone else, so the only way to be subversive was actually to be very constructive, and so we called our piece more, more, more future. as a way of resisting. Resisting cynicism, resisting pessimism. As a way of saying that we're here, we're not victims. We acknowledge all the suffering, we acknowledge the weight of history, the weight of colonialism, dictatorships, and all that, but we're still alive. So more, more, more future. We'll make a circle, bring in people, start small, find allies, and dream with them. And it's been this journey where it is a personal journey, it's a collective journey. So at first, we made, I only made group pieces. I refused to make any solos, although the demand was high. His presenters, yeah, they like cheap things, you know, and they would have, they'd have me for cheap if I'm alone. I was like, no, 
I do this to be with people. I do this to create a circle. But then, after 10 years, I felt lost in our circle. So it's like, oh, maybe I should now go back to myself. What's happening here? Where am I in the middle of all this? What's my name? That's when, in 2001, I made my first solo. And I called it Le Cargo, the cargo ship. It's like I'm bringing my baggage. And this was just a journey. A journey to a village where I'd lived until age eight, that is 1982. I lived there because my father, my father, my daddy was, um, was a primary school uh, teacher in the village school. And my father, my father, my daddy, he used to play football, or here you say soccer, in Obilo. And he was the best goalkeeper. Every Sunday we'd go and admire him in the stadium. The stadium is actually a big name for just a patch of land that was cleared in the forest, but we called it stadium, Stadium Kauka. And my father, my father, my daddy was also the choir master in the village, in, uh, in the Catholic church. And with him in his choir, I learned how to sing. And one of the first songs that I learned was like, And I made this trip to this village because it was in this village called Obilo that by then I could locate my oldest memories of dance. And so the idea was like, yeah, how do I go to the sources? And that's when another poet came back to me. He was born in Syria, then he moved to Lebanon, and later on to France. He adopted as a writer the name Adonis. And in one of his poems called The Pearl, there are these lines. How do I walk towards myself, towards my people? with my blood on fire and my history in ruins. So making this trip to Obilo, where, as far as I could remember, I could locate my oldest memories of dance, was, that was the, the question in the background. How do I walk to myself? 
And from there on, it started becoming really like a back and forth between making a journey with, for myself and the necessity to have the circle. In fact, even as I'm in front of you tonight, we may be separated by the invisible fourth wall of the Italian proscenium theater. I still approach it with this question of like, how do I negotiate the possibility of a circle? Maybe I look at this space as like the acknowledgement of the fact that that ideal of the circle doesn't exist. I don't know if it ever existed in any society, in any uh, <laughs> historic period. But if it ever existed, well, it's broken. And so the Italians, when they invented their theater, it's as if they said, oh, so the circle is here, some trickster, god or whoever, came with scissors and cut through, separated the lines and straightened them, and it became the theater. And so it's the poet, the actor's job to reconnect. And because it's been broken, the pieces can never be brought back together again, it can only be for a moment. And then you have to work for it again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. Meaning that it's about taking responsibility for that thing to happen. Meaning that I could not afford to just be Kabaku. I had to step out or in and say, hey, how do we reconnect? How do we negotiate this? So I'll bring people together, but sometimes I'll also retreat. And then three years ago, the journey went even further. And it's actually all started in New York. Because the Metropolitan, three years ago, the Metropolitan Museum, they performing, the perform the Met Live, um, the performance um, section, they got in touch asking me if I could do something in their galleries. As they often do with performers. So I came for a site visit and the first thing I asked them was if they could show me every piece from the Congo that they had in that museum. Because yeah, wherever I go, I'm searching for Congo. It's like a broken mirror uh, whose pieces had been scattered across the world and I'm trying to find pieces and I know there are pieces all over. And every museum in the world that has a piece of, a piece from the Congo has a piece of myself, a piece of my history. It's loot from ruins. But so I asked them to show me the pieces from the Congo that they have. They don't have much. It's not like the Terravuran Museum in Belgium where you have more than 100,000 pieces. Here they have like 120 or something. And actually some of the, uh, the origin of some pieces can even be contested because you would say, oh, are they from Northern Angola or are they from the Congo? So I saw like 120 plus pieces some on display, some have never been shown, just in storage. And there, there was one wooden sculpture, 82 centimeters high. I don't know how, uh, what's that in inches or feet. 
Um, and there was just a note, origin, Lengola. And for me, it was like, well, I think I've found what I can work on here. But for the curators, especially the African arts curators, it was like, no, this is not interesting. It's not an important piece. It, um, yeah, that's why it's never been um, exhibited since it, uh, it entered the collections in 1986. And I was like, you know what? This is the most important piece in this museum as far as I'm concerned because it's the only one that can say something about my story, about my history, because my mother comes from the Lengola people. So I took pictures of that piece and the video, and I invited my mother to go on a journey with me to the village of Banataba, which is around 150 kilometers, so 100 miles south of Ikisangani, a village in the forest, a village by the Congo River. That's where my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, was born. But then later on, he left to come to the city, and he never went back there. And my mother last went to Banataba in 1975. I was one year old. And his only... sibling of the seven that they, they used to be, who's still alive, had not even been there since 1970. So I invited both of them to travel with me to their father's birthplace. And I took these pictures, and the idea was to just go and see if these traditions still existed. If there's ways of recording history were still alive, or they've all disappeared and only existed in European and um, you know, in Western museums. And I was dreaming that if I found people who could still make those pieces, I would bring one to the Met, because when I asked the, the story of that sculpture, no one really knew its story. You know, so it's like, okay, you just have this piece here. It's in storage, and you can say what it is. I was like, okay, uh, if I find someone who can still make these pieces, I'd like to bring one here. In fact, what, um, what you have, the one you have here, she's very lonely. She needs company. You know, she needs company from home. And if she has company from home, she will hear stories from the land that she left many decades ago. But maybe she can tell us stories from that land from many decades ago. The first reaction from the Met was like, oh, well, a piece of art cannot enter the museum like that. It, goes, it needs to go through a complicated process of acquisition. And <laughs> that will be difficult, almost impossible. Then someone said, but it can enter if you say that it's not art, but it is prop for the performance. which poses a big question, really. Who decides what is art when it comes to us? Whose gaze decides that? I made the journey. And I was pleasantly surprised to see that it may be dormant, but it's not dead. 
people still know how to record history in that fashion. People still pass on stories from the past. Going there, I heard, no, I heard stories of ancestors from many, many generations back. I can go as far back as like, the early 18th century, so I can, I can almost for sure say who of my ancestors was there when the first Arab slave traders came to that region. or who was there when Pontier, the first Belgian commander, got there and founded the city of Pontierville. Today it's called Ubuntu, that's where I was born. But there was also one thing very sad about that journey, which was that to realize that history had only recorded men's names. So I can go yeah, like seven generations back from my grandfather, but it's almost exclusively men's names. The only one, there's one woman who's recorded and for the wrong reasons. Because Akande, my ancestor, had a sister, Abuna. Akande had fishing ponds, and one day they were there to get the fish out of the ponds. Abuna's daughter drowned. And so we have ancestral, my clan has ancestral rights on an island, on the Congo River. So when I went there, it was like, this is your island. This is your land. You should do something about it. Then I asked about the story. Just like the ancestral um, land rights is the, uh, was for a long time that... So there are two levels of land ownership. The first one is the ancestral, and that one is the first come, the first person who establishes themselves some, somewhere is the rightful owner of that piece. And Akande was the first one to settle on that island, which is like seven kilometers, no, 5.5 kilometers long and 700 meters wide. It's like a huge piece of land. It became the island of Akande. But when his niece died there. He gave one of the 32 big fish ponds to his sister as a way of paying the price of blood. And so people started saying, on the island of Akande, there is also Abuna's fish pond. So that's the only tragic event. It because of this tragic event that you remember this woman. So this journey, Banataba, where I met like a sculpture, uh, a sculptor who made a beautiful piece for me. And because like my uncle, who's the head of our clan there, wanted uh, to organize a ceremony for me. Because uh, like this way, when you come back, you can sit. You can sit in the circle of men because you've been initiated. And when you go through the initiation, you have your sculpture. So it was like all pieces were falling into place. So I went through the ceremony with that. And at the end, the priest was like, now this thing is worth something. Before a ceremony, it's just a piece of wood. And for me, it was like, okay, if now it's, it's something, I can't take it away. 
because everything that has value from that country has found its way outside. And I cannot continue the same path of exfiltrating everything that has value. So it stayed in the village under the custody of André, my uncle, and who since have organized some ceremonies from, for other younger children from the clan with that. But what's also interesting is that it can be rented to other clans for their ceremonies. And I love this idea of art as something that we activate or deactivate. And it's not sacred all the time, encased in behind some glass wall, no. It lives with us, and sometimes it helps us get food. Some other times it becomes the getaway to our ancestors. Some other times it's just a piece of wood sitting there and even children can play with it. But it, as we go on, the question more and more is, for me at least, is it enough just to tell my stories? Maybe not. Césaire says, I'll say to myself, beware my body and soul, beware above all of crossing your arms and assuming the sterile attitude of the spectator because life is not a spectacle, because a sea of sorrows is not a proscenium, because a man who cries out is not the dancing bear. Is telling my stories enough? What is it like to be in the district of Lubunga on the southern bank of the Congo River in Kisangani where I live around 200, 300,000 people? We don't know exactly because the last census was in 1984. but it's estimated that like, there are 250, 300,000 people living there and they don't have running water and I want to make art there and we're building a neighborhood art center there. So first, like, okay, we'll need to have some electricity. We can turn to solar. But then if I have electricity here, I lived, I grew up in part there, so, and as a child, there used to be some electricity in Lubunga, in the Catholic parish, and they had a, um, like a room where we'd go sometimes in the evening to do our homework. So, okay, maybe Studio Kabaku in Lubunga, could provide that because now that there is no more electricity, even the Catholic parish doesn't have. Um, the room is there, but they can't use it for that. So it's like, okay. But then we hear, I know that young kids, there is no bridge on the Congo River uh, in that part uh, of the country. So you need to take a pirogue across the river the few libraries that are there in the, country, uh, in the city are on the other side. So it's like, well, maybe at Studio Kabaku, we can have, even if it's just two, no, no, 10, 20 computers with 
a lot of educational material. Young students can stay on this side and they wouldn't have to pay the boat ride to the other side and they can access that here. And they'll have a room where they can do their homeworks. Of course, we can't accommodate everyone, but if every day we can get um, 50 um, young men and women a space where they can quietly work, that's already something. Then it's like, well, I can't buy bottled water all the time. We need to have some clean water for ourselves. Then we study the, the question and you realize that it's not so expensive to produce clean drinking water. If you invest like 4,000 US dollars, you can produce clean, enough clean water for 1,000 people every day. And you only need 450 euros every two years for the cartridges and it doesn't need any uh, electricity, it's, it's microfiltration technology. So we invested in that. It's like, we'll produce water, we cannot give water to 200,000 people, but 1,000 people can come to Studio Kabaku and get water. So Studio Kabaku becomes like the metaphor for a source. You can get water for your body, you can also get water for your soul with the arts. Is it still art? I don't know. And does it really matter? All I know is that we are coming together and working together to create a space where we can reimagine ourselves. And so, maybe that's all that matters, and call it art, call it social work. But it's about that act of imagination, reimagining who we are. Adiria, hoyo, hoyo, Adiria, hoyo, hoyo, ho, Adiria, 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 Stop it.